everyone. Welcome to episode number 609 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My guest this week is Adam Tilton, CEO and co-founder of Driver. Adam and I discuss how Driver's new AI-powered platform can help you navigate code, organize your assets, and sync your code bases with ease. We also investigate the benefits of automated updates, unified search, and language specialization included in their platform, and the role that reusable templates play in Driver's new AI-powered platform. So, without further ado, please welcome Adam to Fish Fry. Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, tell me about the motivation to create Driver. Happy to. It was a selfish motivation. I mean, I am an engineer, bachelor's, master's, PhD, all in engineering from University of Illinois. And since my university days, I've been working with embedded systems. As a teaching assistant, I TA'd courses on the MSP430 devices. And my first company was embedded machine learning. I started another company to do infrastructure for connected products. And then at Nike, I was senior director on the team leading connected product software. So over my career, countless number of times, I have had to consume an evaluation kit and a reference manual and a data sheet for a new embedded system, go through with a highlighter, read about its capabilities and how I'm going to enable or disable certain functionalities. And it was a frustrating experience. At Nike, I was on the component selection team as we were choosing the MCU for the device. And then as an embedded engineer, I've written firmware for, geez, I don't know how many devices. So the motivation spark happened while I was working at a company here in Austin, and I had to enable a piece of lab equipment, a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy machine. And once again, I was looking at a dense PDF that described how 250 low-level APIs worked that were enabled through Telnet which meant, you know, start by message, stop by really difficult to decode. And I had the idea to work with OpenAI's ChatGPT, I think it was three and a half at the time, and to selectively feed in as part of the prompt bits of information in the PDF about how the different low-level APIs worked and specific code examples that demonstrated it. And I wasn't trying to get it to write code. I just wanted the LLM to help me understand what I needed to know about each of the APIs so that I could go and enable it in the system that I was working on. So that's where the core of the idea came from. I was just trying to get a job done faster and I needed to quickly decode some complex piece of equipment and I didn't want to have to thumb through a PDF. And as I was working on that, I started to show what I was doing to my now co-founder, Daniel, who was working with me at the time. And I just said, hey, you know, why don't we build a system where you can consume these complex pieces of equipment that we've had to work with throughout our careers, code bases, documentation, et cetera, and build a solution that allows you to effectively describe, write a document about what it is that you're trying to do. And now we found that a lot of other people have this problem too, whether you're, you're hoping to describe to somebody else how to leverage your technology and you need to produce clear and concise descriptions of how the technology works, or whether you're working with complex technology and trying to describe to yourself how you're going to leverage that technology in the context of your own use case, our tool can be super valuable. Fantastic. Now, your platform includes code base sync, automated updates, unified search, and language specialization. So walk me through each of these segments. And let's start with code base sync. We're looking at real-time updates here, right? Yeah, that's right. So to get started using the platform, the first thing that you do is upload the assets that you want to work with. And these can be code bases or they can be ancillary material like PDFs. And for code bases, it can be in whatever language it's written in. In some cases, that's you know Verilog and System Verilog. Maybe it's assembly C, C++ or Rust or Python or Java. So code base, you know, I mean, the particular languages that the code base are in, you need to be able to support that. So step one, upload your code bases into the platform. From there, what we do is 
quite a lot of pre-processing to understand the structure of the code base using traditional computer science tools so that we can do things like detect all of the symbols in the code, uh, global variables, functions, classes, et cetera. Uh, we build complex data structures in the backend to help us map to the code base. And then once that's complete, we have complex process that leverages large language models to produce a complete set of foundational technical documentation. So upload your code base, we do some processing and minutes to maybe hours if it's many millions of source lines of code later, you'll have a full, complete, automatically produced set of technical documentation, and that's great. But of course, most code bases are dynamic. They're not static assets that aren't changing, they're being committed to, in some cases, multiple times a day. And you would like to be able to keep your documentation up to date with the state of the code. But that's very difficult. It's not always the case that every commit should lead to a full new set of documentation. You may have customers that are using an older version of your software, so you want to support the documentation for older versions as well as documentation for the new versions. So how you keep things in sync and up to date is a complex problem that you have to solve within the context of how the user wants their documentation to exist. And so we support that. So we automatically consume the updates. We can propagate those changes into the documentation, only updating the parts of the documentation that need to be updated based on the code that's changed. That's possible because of the data structures that we've built in the backend that map the documentation to the underlying source assets. So we, we understand the relationship between code changing and documents that need to be updated. And then we provide the user with flexible version control so that they can decide you know, whether something is a minor update or whether they want to tag a particular set of the documentation as a release and then keep that as unchanged in the future or create a duplicate copy for the future release. So there's a lot that goes into being able to consume and automatically produce the underlying documentation and then keep all of that in sync as those underlying assets are changing. Okay, so what about the automated updates part of your solution? What kind of benefits are we talking about here? You know, every engineer has had the experience, and I've certainly had this experience in my career. You come into a code base that was written years ago by engineers who are no longer around. And the documentation that you find, maybe it sits with the code or maybe it's on another solution like a Confluence or a documentation solution. And I remember countless number of times I pull up a code base. I'll give you a specific example from Nike. So I go into uh, Nike's massive enterprise GitHub. There's thousands of internal applications. I find the one that I need to now interact with. It's 2019 and I look and the documentation was last edited in 2013. And you think to yourself, there is absolutely no way that I can trust this documentation. Even if I spent the time reading it, I'm still going to have to go into the code base because the code has probably changed since anybody came back and updated this now out of sync bit of documentation. The only thing that's worse than no documentation is having out of date and misleading documentation. It's never before been possible to automatically keep docs up to date with code bases that are changing without manual effort. We find that engineers will typically spend 20, sometimes as much as 30% of their time on documentation level tasks. It's a lot of work to keep all the docs up to date with where the source code is. So the automatic updates part of our solution is sort of the foundational component. Upload your code bases, will automatically produce the documentation from our integration with the source code provider, the source code repository. And then from there, as the underlying source code changes, we'll keep it up to date. And just as a, an interesting metric about the amount of documentation that we can generate and compared to what it would take an engineer to do, we uploaded a 2.2 million source line of code code base, produced the foundational technical documentation, and then we counted the number of words that we produced. And if you had an engineer typing as fast as the fastest human typist, write out all of that documentation manually, it would have taken them 28 days to do what we produced in 2.2 hours. And that's if they were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If they only worked a normal eight hour day, it would have taken three months. And if they spent half their time thinking and half their time writing, you know, if they were thinking about what they needed to document and why and how to describe things, it would have taken them six months. So it's an enormous benefit to be able to automatically produce the foundational tech docs. But that's just the foundation of what Driver AI can provide. So talk to me about the unified search and language specialization as well. Yeah, let's take those as two separate topics. So language specialization is important for a few reasons. The first is that the structure of the documentation that you want 
is typically language specific. Let's give an example of that. In Python, you may have a class with attributes and methods, whereas in System Verilog, you may have modules. So how you describe software depends on the language that you're describing. Each of them is unique. So we specialize the way that our documentation gets presented by the language that the software is written in. There are other reasons to do this too, technical reasons about how you make sense of a particular software language. Like for example, if it's a compiled language, you can use the front end of the compiler, or you may have a specific abstract syntax tree that you can use to better understand the structure of the language. So we do a lot of this. We automatically identify what language the software is written in, and then we adapt how we produce the documentation so that it meets that language. So language specialization is really about producing very high quality content in the tech docs. The integrated search and unified search capabilities, besides the foundational documentation, we provide interactive utilities to our end users so that the tech docs get produced automatically, but the users can use our tool to then produce additional documentation. Like for example, if I have a code base example for an MCU, so I have an MCU that I'm providing and I want to demonstrate to my end users some best practices about how to work with that MCU. So I make a code example that demonstrates the functionality. And now I want to write a guide that describes what it is that my code example is intending to communicate. So I produce a bit of documentation for it. You can come into our system and you can describe the sort of document that you want us to produce. And then we will automatically generate the content. So like you can have a introductory section where you want us to describe the purpose and the features and the background of the code base, and we'll produce content that aligns with your intent. To be able to do that, our system needs to have very rich, robust search. It needs to be able to support things like keyword search. So if you ask about a particular function, we'll describe that function, but also contextual search. If you're asking in English language how to accomplish something from the software, we need to find the appropriate software and surface that to you to then describe to you how you would go about doing that. And when we're providing those answers, we also include the references back to the code base. So as you're describing something, you can read about how it's described, you can see the source content that was reviewed in coming up with that. And then you can work with our system if it's required to edit the text directly or to provide feedback about the specific references, like you know, pay more attention to this thing over here and don't look at that so much to help it generate the types of content that you would want. And this removes the barrier from the end user having to have the full context of the code base in their mind at any point in time, which as code bases grow in complexity is very difficult to do. Even if you're familiar with a code base, it can be helpful to have a tool point to the right places for you to go and look at where things are being implemented. So your solution also includes reusable templates, right? Yeah, we found that this is one of the most requested features from end users. It's often the case that you will create the same shape of a document over and over again, but for different underlying source information. Codebase README is a universal example of this. Every README should have a you know, two sentence description of what the purpose of this code base is, the steps on how to get started using it, installation steps if that's required, an overview of the structure of the code base architecturally, maybe some details about the license that the code base is written under. So we found that a lot of our users were generating the same structured document, but related to different underlying source assets. So instead of starting from scratch every time, you can produce a template. And all a template is, is two things. It's fixed text that the LLM system will not edit for example, an introductory paragraph about the company, like the marketing messaging, maybe a legal disclaimer that is standard in stock and included in everything. And then there are parts of the document that you want the LLM system to generate. And then there are parts of the document that you want the LLM system to generate for you. And how you do that in a template is you write the intent. In this part of the document, I want you to provide a two sentence overview of the code base that would be useful to someone who has never looked at this code base before. Or I want you to outline the installation steps and provide code examples of each step so that users can quickly understand how to get started using this code base across Windows, Linux, and Mac. And then you can save that template. And in the future, you can apply that template to a new code base and press the run button and it will produce that document for you. 
Fantastic. Now, Adam, where is Driver headed from here? I saw you guys received $8 million in seed funding led by Google Ventures. Is that right? Yes, we just announced that last week. I'm very excited to be working with GV. They're just an excellent partner. We just launched a new product along with the announcement. And that product is the culmination of lots of work from the team and also the interactions that we've had with our early design partners. Our focus with that product now is signing up additional customers, which we're doing very quickly. It's been a lot of fun since we announced everything at Embedded World. We're getting great traction with the market. There are a lot of engineers who identify with the problem that we're solving and are excited to get started using it. So that's a big focus. We'll be expanding out our go-to-market team. And then on the engineering side, we have some really exciting additional product features that will be coming up, both on the core technology side, generally improving the way that our technical documentation describes projects, including things like identifying the dependency trees of code bases so that you can quickly hop around and ask questions about, you know, where is this function used inside the code base, et cetera. We'll also be bringing additional features that are industry specific. One use case that I'm super excited about personally that I've seen be really valuable to customers is writing documentation about whether or not software meets a specific set of requirements. So we've done some early work on this with some of our design partners where they've given us the requirement specification for a particular source code asset. And then our system can be used to produce documentation that takes each requirement and expresses whether or not the software has appropriately met that requirement. And if so, or if not, how or how not. So there's a bunch of additional functionality that we'll be building into the platform. We're growing the engineering team for that. And those are the two points of focus for us. Fantastic. All right, Adam, it is time for your off the cuff question. All right. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. What would you have? Uh, Well, lucky for me, if I could eat anything right now, I wouldn't need a passport and I wouldn't even need to go very far. I think I would walk over to the barbecue here in Austin, Texas and have some barbecue, especially the brisket and a smoked turkey. That sounds so good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Adam. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun chatting with you. Also, if you'd like more information about Driver, I've included a couple links on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing... I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon 2. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and our new animated series called Libby's Lab. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of November 15th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>